Good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath, and welcome to our Friday night study. Uh, before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath, for the precious hours that you've given us each week uh, to fellowship with you and with one another, and where we have an extra measure of your Holy Spirit. We're thankful for the truths that unfold to us and the time that we have on the Sabbath to contemplate these truths and to apply them to our lives and to think about the past week and the blessings of it and to look forward um, for strength for the trials of the week ahead. We pray for each person that you can bless them, that your angels can watch over them. And we need you in our lives. Help us to understand the things that we study this evening as we read A.T. Jones' presentations from 1893. We know, Lord, that these are precious truths, and the waters have been muddied um, by the tramplings of those who oppose the truth ever since 1893 and 1888. And these things are not understood any longer within Adventism, even among conservatives, we just pray, Lord, that you can help us appreciate these truths, that we can apply them to our lives, and that we can be a witness, that we can reflect Christ's character, that we can behold his character, and that others will see his character shine through us. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you and not to look to self. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath and good evening again. Um, so as we've been going through A.T. Jones' presentations from 1893, um, and if people haven't watched them all, even though they're long, there's lots of reading, it's a lot of, a lot of details uh, that we've gone through in these studies. But especially when it comes to uh, Jones' sermons, um, and, and this, this series here that he's doing in 1893, we know that he's believes that the mighty angel of revelation 18 has come down. His history is typifying our history. Um, he's looking at what happened in his time, which, which would be a parallel to our understanding of nine 11. So he believes he's in the Sunday law time period and that he has this special message to give the third angel's message. And he understands uh, that, that it is connected to the first and second angels' messages. So there's lots of truth that he has here. But we know that uh, the main problem is that the first and second angels' messages had actually been rejected by Adventism. Jones isn't really aware of this. But he is proclaiming the third angels' message. And Ellen White endorses what is happening here, that a work is occurring um, in repentance and confession, a confession, uh, yeah, repentance and confession of sins. Um, but of course, that work does not continue, right? So we know what happens in the history of Adventism, that this message is ultimate, ultimately rejected. Um, but what they do is they make that they have actually accepted it. And a good example of that, and a book that we're actually going to read later, is going to be... Um, uh, A.G. Daniel's book on on Christ our righteousness. And I can't remember the exact title. I think it's Christ our righteousness or the righteousness of Christ. I know that uh, Wagner's presentations from 1888 had three different titles: Christ our righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, and um, uh, Christ and our righteousness, or something like that. So I always get those titles all mixed up. But um, and so, but we need this foundation from A.T. Jones' presentations here. Now, this, this next chapter is really talking about uh, the character of God and beholding the character of God. So we're going to begin reading. Of course, people can ask questions. They can stop me. I end up doing a lot of reading here. It's, it's fairly intense, and I comment every now and then. Um, but I try to read it with expression, with clarity. I try to... You know, I'm understanding what I'm reading. If and and 
if I think that something might not be clear, I clarify it as much as I can. But if there's something you don't understand, don't uh, worry about stopping me and trying to get it to be clarified. That's fine. <clears throat> and, and definitely, if you have any insights into what's what's being read, I'd appreciate you share those with all of us. It'd be great, you know. To, and I can stop talking for a little bit. Okay, so this is number 19. E.T. Jones says, we will begin tonight with the first verse of Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This same number is referred to in the seventh chapter and fourth verse. But I read it from the first verse, however. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000. Now, I just want to make a comment here about this passage. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the Bible, because um, Jones isn't going to address these points here, but uh, I think they're um, important points for us to understand. So when we go to Revelation... Uh, chapter 7, we have, of course, the 144,000 um, being taken uh, from the different tribes. So we have uh, four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, right? And, um, and there's going to be this seal that's going to be mentioned. Now, if we've studied the book of Revelation, we know that this is, is going to be mentioned in connection with um, chapter 9 of Revelation. So, and this, this, this is something that really confuses people who study, uh, because lots of people take Revelation 9 and place this in the future, so that Revelation 9, the trumpets, 8 and 9 are all future things somehow sometimes connected with the seven last plagues, sometimes not. Um, but we know in Revelation 9, 4, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So we know this is about Islam, and this is in the history of uh, the rise of Islam. And this command here is the command of Abu Bakr. Right. So we have Abu Bakr's command recorded in history. Um, I've looked at it in other studies and show how they translate it now is very different from how it was translated um, in um, Gibbon's uh, history of, of Rome. Um, but. Um, so we know that this this symbol of the seal of God is used here. So. So people have this hard time. Well, they have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And so people want to put this into the future. So I know Jones isn't addressing this point. Um, but why, do, why is this here? I mean, if you were just reading the book of Revelation through sort of as a chronological understanding, that it's just it's going to be going through the history of the end times. That's futurism does it that way. And we see that this sealing, we know that this is in the future. Right, and that that these angels are going to be holding back these winds until the servants of God are sealed on their heads. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of an aside from the study, but I just thought it was important to look at it. So, why why do we have Revelation seven is referring to the hundred and forty four thousand at the end of the world dealing with the seal of God, and why do we have this in Revelation nine where it's going to address the seal of God. So these are people that are not keeping the Sabbath is how we understand it. But this is before the seal of God happens in Revelation 7. I mean, it's going to be what? 
thousand years or whatever, right? Um, that we're going to have this more than a thousand years. You're looking at uh, whatever year that is. I can't remember six. Uh, can't remember the year. But but anyway, anybody have an answer to this question? So here we have something dealing with Islam. That's how we understand it. And it's going to talk about those that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. That Abu Bakr's command says, don't basically hurt the Sabbath keepers. Um, so why? I know that's a very big, broad, vague question. Okay, look at Revelation 9. What's, what's the verse that we focus on in Revelation 9? Do we have Revelation 9, 11. Okay, so why do we do that? I mean, obviously we, we know about 9, 11. But we read this, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. It says, one woe is passed, behold, there are two woes more hereafter. So this is going to be talking about um, dealing with the first woe, right? And the end of the first woe, this king is going to be um, uh, Othman, right? So it's going to be in on the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical ca biblical calendar, July 27th. Um, uh, what's the year now? Oh, my brain's. Uh, that's going to be, um, what year is that again? 1299. Yeah, 1299. Okay. That's, that's what I was thinking. It just doesn't seem right. But anyway, 1299. So we're going to have, um, and it's going to be in 1449 that you're going to have the 150 years work. So that works out. So in 1299, so this is the 26th day of the fourth month. Um, so we have this prophecy dealing with um, Islam. And we know that 911 um, is connected to we have a mathematical proof, so to speak, where we can connect 9-11 to the prophecy of Revelation 9. And how do we do that? Prophecy of Revelation 9 is going to end when? If I, if I am mistaken, it's... <clears throat> 1840, August 11th. Yeah, so 1840. And so we do this, and, and there's different ways you could do the calculation. But we take 2001, and we multiply it, whoops, multiply it by 360, right? We get this number, 720,360. And we divide it by 1840. And when we do so, we get 391.5. Now, this proof was done before we started talking about the 391.5 years from uh, the time that the kingdoms divided uh, to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, or even in tying that to the 391.5 uh, days in our history from October 13th 2018 to November 9th, 2019. So, so we had this 391.5 used as a symbol. It's the 391 years and a half of a month is how they look at this symbol. And so we connect 1840 to 2001. And we take that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down at 9-11. Jones says, no, that's 1990 or 1892, right? dealing with the Chicago World's Fair. So 
So Jones is looking at this, and that's why I'm, I'm looking at this, because it, it's tying us to 9-11, this prophecy. But in this prophecy, it has elements that relate to the end time events, not just the history of Islam. And, and I think this is just an important point that we, we often don't really understand when it comes to when it comes to understanding the scriptures as Seventh-day Adventists, we never really used line upon line as laid out in Isaiah 28. So, so we can take this, the seal of the servant of the gods in their foreheads in chapter 7, and we can see it relates to chapter 9. But we know it relates to our history. And so the third woe begins at 9-11. And this is something Jones doesn't have. Uh, for the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down in 1892, right? So we have some more details. So I know it's a little bit of a side as far as his topic is concerned, but I just thought I would bring that point out because I think it does relate as an undercurrent of understanding his history in comparison with ours, because that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the message of righteousness by faith as much as conservative Adventists believe that they understand it, uh, they don't, because I've talked to many leaders in conservative Adventism. And when you share statements in Jones and Wagner and some statements in the spirit of prophecy that no, they're not familiar with, they reject them. They, they don't think it's true uh, because they have a false understanding. But <clears throat> Adventism inherited that uh, from... Uh, at the end of the first generation and the second generation, which ended up rejecting this, that message. Anyway, so let's go on and read here. It says, all we read, all we read these two scriptures for is to get to the connection, which shows that the seal of God and the name of God are inseparably, inseparably connected. So that's why he's reading this. The 144,000 had the name of their father in their foreheads. And they were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. Then, when we find out what the name of God is, we shall know what the seal of God is. For that which will bring us to us his name, and put in our minds his name, and put upon us and in us his name, will be the seal of God. Now turn to Exodus 3, 13 and 14. This refers to the time when the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. He said, sent him to deliver the people of God from Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. The Lord has said to him, so far only this, as we read in the sixth verse, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now Moses asks, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto him, uh, said unto Moses, I, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, moreover, unto Moses, thou shalt, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. But what is his name? I am that I am. He had said, and they knew, that he was the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of their fathers. They knew their fathers had a God whom they worshiped. And these folks had heard of the God of their fathers and they remembered though dimly now the God of their fathers. But now he reveals to them that the God of their fathers is the God whose name is I am that I am. And this is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. But then the name of God and his memorial go together. Do you see? But what is his name? I am. 
only? No, his name is not simply I am, but I am what? I am. That is the idea of that I am, that which or what I am. Now, it is not enough, it is not enough, you see, for the Lord to state to men that he is, but we need to know now that he is what he is for the knowledge of himself to do us any good. Existence is to us not enough to know of God. It is not enough for us to know that he exists, but we need to know what he is and what he exists for in respect to us. Therefore, he did not say simply, I am, that is my name. He said, no, but I am what I am. That is his name. And if we will know God truly, we must know not only that he is, but that he is what he is. And until we know what he is, we do not know him. The same thought is expressed in Hebrew 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Well, what is the reward which God gives to those who seek him? It is himself. Himself. All he is and all that he has. But if we had all that he has without having himself, what good would that do us? You see, if we had all that he has and we're still ourselves, we would, we would be simply supreme. Well, the next thing... Um, <clears throat> to devils, would we not? To give a man all that God has, and he's still remaining the man that he is, it would be a fearful thing. Therefore, it is nothing to us that God gives us all that he has, unless he gives us what he is, unless he gives us himself. Therefore, when he gives us what he is, giving us himself, his character, his nature, and his disposition, then we can use what he is as well as what he has in his fear and to his glory. Consequently, the same thought is here, is there, not only that he is, but he is what he is. And he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is what he is. Well, then to follow this thought, what is God first of all, first of all, to all things, and all persons in the universe, the congregation, the creator. Assuredly, the first thing that he is to, is to anything, animate or inanimate, is creator. For by him all things exist. He is author of all things. Then the first thing for men, for angels, for int or intelligences, is to know him as creator. Now he says, I am that I am. Then the first thing that comes to any creature as to what he is, that is, understanding his name, is that he is creator. So we found that in connection with his name, his memorial stands inseparable. And therefore, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now turn to Ezekiel 20, 20. You are familiar with the scripture. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. What is the Sabbath a sign of them? A sign that he is the Lord God. But what he, but that he, um, a sign that he is the Lord God, but that he is the Lord God in point of existence. That is not his name, but it is more than that. But the Sabbath being a sign that he is Lord God, it is not the sign that he is what he is, as well as that he is. Congregation, yes. Now think of that. Is it congregation? Yes, sir. The Sabbath being the sign that he is the true God and he having told us that he is what he is. Therefore, the Sabbath is the sign of what God is, as well as the sign that he is. See, congregation, yes. Then that being his name, I am what I am. And the Sabbath being the sign that he is what he is. Don't you see? how that his name forever, that is his name forever, and that it that is his memorial forever. 
then he is given the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He is given that as the memorial that he is the Lord. Consequently, that is my name forever. That is his memorial. Boy says, please repeat that. Now, I have a hard time somebody asking some Jones to repeat something because he repeats himself all the time. But he's going to repeat himself. So just hang on here. All right. Let us go back and take the thought at the beginning. The Sabbath, he says, ye shall hallow, and it shall be a sign. Saturday is not a sign of the true God. Saturday is not anything. A man who keeps Saturday can do so without knowing the Lord, just as he can keep Sunday without knowing the Lord. But he can't keep the Sabbath without knowing the Lord. There are three classes of observers of a day in the world. But Jones actually writes a book on this, um, or a booklet. Um, the Sabbath, it's called uh, the Jewish Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, and the Sabbath of the Lord, and showing that there's three different Sabbaths, See, three different things that people call the Sabbath. There are Saturday keepers, Sunday keepers, and Sabbath keepers. What God wants is Sabbath keepers. But there has been too many Saturday keepers pretending to be Sabbath keepers. That is the mischief of the of these last days. Now, he's not just talking about the sense of, you know, the distinction between the hours of the Sabbath and the hours of Saturday, right? He's talking about what, what it really means to keep the Sabbath. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign. That is the thing to start with. Then the Sabbath is a sign which he has set for us, which he himself has given, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath being the sign that he is the Lord God. He is not only God in point of existence, but he is, and he is what he is, for that is his name. See, I am what I am, the Lord God. The Sabbath is a sign that he is the Lord God. The Sabbath, therefore, is a sign that he is, and that he is what he is. But his name, he says, is I am that I am. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The sign that he is what he is, is what? Congregation, the Sabbath. But he says, the Sabbath is my memorial. He hath made a memorial for his wonderful, wonderful works, and so on. Then don't you see that that which is the sign that he is what he is, that being his name forever, that is his memorial forever. Now shall I say it over? Voice, no, I can see that. Have you got that now, congregation? Yes, sir. Well, now let us go on with it. The Sabbath being the sign that he is and that he is what he is. And the first thing that he is is creator. And the first thing that the Sabbath then must signify is creator. But is that the only thing that it will signify? No. Because he is more than that, not more than that in the sense of being different from that because all things are in that. But what he is in that is more largely expressed in other places. So we can know more fully what he is in that. Well, then, Exodus 31, 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, it is a sign that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. And wherein is it? this sign it is not because in six days the lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested it was refreshed <clears throat> it being a sign of that because he did that it is a sign of himself in the doing of that is that so voice says yes now put the two together it is a sign that he is the lord because in six days he made heaven and earth then as we have found <coughs> The first thing that God is, is creator. The first thing that the Sabbath signifies is creator and signifying what he is. But the Sabbath commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, remember the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath day? 
as we have already read in the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, a sign that ye may know that I am the Lord. Remember that thing which signifies that I'm God. We are to remember that thing which signifies that he is God. Then is not that the memorial which brings him to people's remembrance? For what? For that is what a memorial is for, to bring to remembrance. He wants to be brought to the remembrance of his creatures and is given that which will do it. And now he tells us, remember that thing which will do it. Now, a thought right there. We are to remember the thing that brings him to remembrance, or in another word, brings him to mind. When he is brought to mind, he is not only brought there as he who exists, but as what he is. And when he, for what he is, is brought to our minds, that is his name, is it not? Where is the name? Congregation in the forehead. With the mind, I serve the law of God. See? Then God wants to be in people's minds. And the Sabbath is that which brings himself, not a theory of him, but himself, to bring him to the remembrance, to bring him to mind, because the Sabbath is the sign that I am the Lord your God. And now remember the sign, remember that which signifies and brings to mind myself, brings to mind the Lord thy God, and what, and he is what he is, to bring him and what he is to our, uh, your mind, that is the thought, then is not that his memorial. The very purpose of a memorial, the very object of it, is to bring the thing that is touched upon to mind. So you can see that that being the case, the name of God and his memorial, his Sabbath, cannot be separated at all. Consequently, when he told Moses that I am that I am, that is his name forever, and that is his memorial to all generations, because the memorial brings him to mind, and bringing him to mind as what he is, that puts God into the mind in his real name, and so the Father's name in the minds of those people who are mentioned is the seal of the living God in their foreheads. The first thing then that is signified thus in the Sabbath is creator, creative power. But that is brought to mind through the things which are made. It is a sign that he is the Lord God because he made all these things. Consequently, the Sabbath is the sign, the memorial of the Lord our God as manifested in creation. So Jones has laid this out pretty repetitively, but I think we should be able to get it. Now let us study a moment how he manifested himself in creation. In Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The first verse of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now the 14th verse, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There is another verse we will read right upon the same thing, which tells it, in a different way. Ephesians 3, 9, and the last words of the verse, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Then God in creation manifested himself in and through Jesus Christ. Is that so? Congregation, yes. Then the man who does not know Jesus Christ, will he get right ideas of created things, of creation? Congregation, no. He will not find God there. He will not find the ideas of God there because God is manifested in Christ in creation. Now, further, how did he manifest himself in Christ in creation? In creating, we had better say, perhaps, because we are at the origin of all things now. How then did he manifest himself in Christ in creating? Psalms 33, verse 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was. He commanded, 
and it stood fast. I was there. Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So far we have found that God manifested in creation is the first thing in which what he is can be known. But God is manifested in creating in Jesus Christ, and God is manifest in creating in Jesus Christ by his word. And that word by which he created all things has in it the power to make a thing appear which before could not be seen at all because it was not. See, the words were framed by the word, worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Then after God spoke, Things which were seen, which before he spoke did not appear at all. Nobody could see them. Then there is power in the word which God in Jesus Christ speaks that is able to make a thing, in other words, able to reduce the thing which he names in the word he speaks. That is, God can call those things which be not as though they were and not lie. A man can speak of those things which be not as though they were, uh, but there's no power in his word to produce the thing which he speaks, and consequently he lies. These ones should not be capitalized there, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> they might have been using something where they just kept capitalizing a bunch of he's and got carried away. But anyway, so we know that the man who speaks, that he doesn't have a capital his, right? Okay. And there are many people who do that thing. They speak of those things that are not as though they were, but it is a lie. And the reason that it is a lie is that there is no power in them or their word to produce the thing. They would willingly have it that way. They would willingly have what they are speaking to be real, but it is not so. And they speak of it as though it were, yet it is a lie however much they would like to have it to be real. There is no power in their word to produce the thing desired in their minds when they speak the word. But God is not such. The thought that it is in his mind expressed in a word, the word produces the thing that it was in the thought, the creative energy, the divine power, is in the word which God speaks. Consequently, when there were no worlds that appeared at all, God in Jesus Christ spoke, and the, there the worlds were, and there they are yet, because he spoke them. But just to back up a little bit, just the thought here. I mean, what he's talking about, somebody who, what is somebody who wants things to be, be real, but knows them not to be real? What What kind of thinking is that? So there's People, as he says, he says, how does he put it? Um, they would willingly have it that way. They would willingly have what they are speaking to be real, but it is not so. And they speak of it as though it were, yet it is a lie, however much they would like to have it real. So what kind of thinking is that? How would we describe that today? Maybe you don't follow my train of thought here. Can we create our own reality by just wishing it to be so? Some people might think they can. Yeah, I, I actually know people who believe that they can. That is, they have postmodern thought that we all create our, our own realities and that I just need to believe that something is a certain way and it is. And that's why you can have men uh, believing that they're women, right? They don't have the power to become women, no matter how much they speak it or think it or wish it. And no matter how many operations they get, they're still going to be men. But, the, but God has a creative power and man has substituted Man has taken the place of God in his mind, 
that we can just create our own reality, that we can ignore reality, that we can escape reality and create our own fantasy and wish it to be real. And everybody else around us needs to recognize that our fantasy is real. Now we might you know, say, well, that's of course silly, but it is, as Carl points out, that's Parminder and Tess's theology. Now, remember what they were teaching about parables? What were they saying about parables? Because this is really what they were teaching. What was the parable teaching? What did Parminder say about parables? That if you created a narrative, you created a parable, it would be true that you can create your own parables, right? He wanted people to make parables. You know, I grew up with my dad always speaking in parables. Um, and he believed that if he made a parable, um, that any conclusion he drew from that parable must be true because it's a parable. You know, he didn't realize that you can make a parable that's not true. Right? Parables only have significance if they actually represent reality. So this is an important point that he's that he's making here. Because this is about understanding God's power. And if we understand this, if we understand the gospel in this way, uh, we wouldn't seek to change the world. Right? We wouldn't be involved in politics to make the world better. Because can man make the world better? Can we solve the world's problems? Only God can do that. And he does it by changing the person and he doesn't change them against their will. So we as individuals want to have this creative power in our own lives because that's the only thing we have control over. And through that, God can change us and we can have an influence and effect upon the world. So anyway, just going back then to what he's saying. Um, now, let us read two verses that have these thoughts in them. Not only does the word of God, which he speaks, produce the thing that is in the thought, but it keeps that thing in existence after it is produced and in the place where God wants it after it is produced. I want you to see that the word which God shall speak has all the power in it. Now, turn to Colossians 1 verse 14. He's speaking of Christ, the son of God, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, or by him all things hold together. But what made them? What made this world as it is? The power of his word, voice. He commanded and it stood fast. The world is quite large, and there are a good many ingredients in it, but when he spoke, it came with all the ingredients in it, the word then that produced it holds it together in the shape that it is. Well, then, now the other thought in the third verse of Hebrews, first chapter, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. What holds up these up since they were made? Congregation, the word of his power. Has he been compelled to keep on talking since he spake that time in order to keep these things in place? Congregation, no. It is 
Is it necessary that he should keep on talking to the world every day to hold it together? Congregation, no. Is it necessary that he should keep on talking all the time to the other worlds and planets to keep them in their courses and in their places? No, the word which produced them in the beginning has in it the creative power which holds them together and holds them up. In 2 Peter 3, verse 1 to 7, uh, it says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Mindful of what? The words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Why are we to remember them? Because he wants us to find out what those words are worth. And remembering the words to obtain in our minds, in our lives, the strength and the force of the words. Because the words which were spoken by the prophets were the words of God, which they spake by the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So these words that we are to remember, these are the words of prophecy. Now, we know that there are people who just think we get to, need to get to know God, you know, pray to him, and he reveals himself to us. And often when people think about of a revelation of God, they think it just happens in that some way. We're, we're walking on the road to Damascus, you know, and, and Christ just appears to us. And that's what we need, you know. Many people have this thinking. But we can have a revelation of God by reading his word, right? The words of God. Because these are creative. They have this power in them. So these words which were spoken by the prophets were the words of God, which they spake by the spirit of Christ, which was in them, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In order to understand who Christ is, we need to understand prophecy. Not just to know that Christ existed but to actually understand his work, we need prophecy. So uh, Jones goes on, mindful of those words then, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That is, people that talk that way, that all things continue as they were from the beginning, are willingly ignorant. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. By what did the world overflow with water? Congregation, the word of God. God spoke. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. What does he call our attention to here in respect to the word which he wants us to remember? He wants us to be fully minded of the words of God, because that word at the first produced the worlds, that word holds them there. That word brought the flood. That word rescued the earth from the flood, and it still keeps it. Then the word that can produce worlds and recover worlds, that word he would have us to keep fully in mind that we may know the power of that word. Well, then you see in all this, there is the same thought still. That the word which produced all holds all together, holds all up, and preserves all until God speaks again. When he speaks again, then everything goes to pieces. For when that day comes, in which there comes a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. Then there are thunderings and lightnings and voices and an earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and the cities of the nations fall. 
The heaven itself splits open and rolls away. I tell you, when that day comes, the man who is fully minded of the word that does it all, he is perfectly safe. Because when that word which produces these things is my confidence, when that word is my foundation, when that word itself is my trust, why no difference if the earth goes on. His word remains. That is all right. Now, this point came up in our study this afternoon with people in our building. Um, because we were talking about uh, time setting. And um, when people time set, the reason for time setting, or the reason even for studying prophecy, not just time setting, but prophecy in general, um, for most people, it's wanting to know what's going to happen in the future for what reason? What's the reason people want to know prophecy? Why do they need to know what's going to happen in the future? Generally speaking, why do people want to know the future? Okay, let's put it this way. Why did the Babylonians use uh, astrology, which is to predict the events that were going to happen in the sky? Why, why, did, they, why did they watch the sky and try to predict things like lunar eclipses and solar eclipses? What, what were they looking for? Why were they doing this? Okay, well, Kara says selfish reasons, but they want to know what's going to come because let's say the king is going to go out to battle. And, and for some reason, you know, he thinks, well, I need to know what the sky is going to be like because I don't want to be surprised by a lunar eclipse because that would be a bad sign. Of course, he never thinks it might be the bad sign for the other guy, but <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? They want to know the future and control the future. Christians, when they look at prophecy, generally speaking, they want to know what's happened so that they can be prepared. Right? So being prepared is, well, and, and there's, there's some truth to this, of course. I mean, Jesus says, you know, you need to watch. I mean, if you knew what an hour your house was going to be broken into, you wouldn't need to watch. Um. So there is kind of a truth that we need to know that we need to watch. And we know there's prophecies. We need to know what to watch for. But people want to uh, figure out what they need to do to get in. Usually it's the lowest limit. What is it that I need to know so that I'm not going to be deceived? But what is it that we need to know so that we will be prepared for Christ's second coming? What is it we need to know? What's the one thing that we need to know that if we know it, we for, for a certainty uh, will be prepared for Christ's coming? Angela? Well, we need to know what his word, word is, is forewarning us about all the signs of his coming, the prophecies, and we need to have a relationship with him. Okay, so we so prophecy has a purpose. Prophecy reveals to us who Christ is so we can know him. But if we study prophecy and we don't know Christ, are we prepared for what's coming upon the world? And I say we know prophecy. That is, we correctly know prophecy. You know, we, we read the Bible. We look at the prophecies. We know them. Is that going to prepare us? Is that alone going to prepare us to meet Christ? Even if we know these prophecies, no, correct. it's not right. Yeah. So we, we so need to know. have the love of Christ in in our lives, and and that only comes from knowing Him, right? And it's His creative power recreating in us His image, His character. So if we don't have His character, if we don't have Him in us, we can't possibly be prepared for the events that are coming upon the world. Right. Even if we know those events, 
We know what's going to happen, even if we knew when it was going to happen. Not knowing him, is it doesn't matter how much other things we know. We won't be prepared to meet him. Okay, so let's go on and read this here. Well, then you see in all this, there is the same thought still, that the word which produced all, all holds all together, holds up all, preserves all, until God speaks again. When he speaks again, then everything goes to pieces, right? So we need to know God's word. Everything's going to go to pieces. For when the day comes in which there comes a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, you know, it is done, then there are thunderings and lightnings. So, you know, we've already read this here, but we can see that we can know God's word, but it's not enough to know about the things that are going to happen. We have to be fully minded of the word that does it all. And if we know him, then we can be perfectly safe. So then God was manifest in Christ by his word in creating and is still manifest thus in the created things, in creating, in preserving, holding together and holding up. So that gravitation is God in Jesus Christ. Science tells us that the law of gravitation holds things up, you know. But what is gravitation? Why, that is what holds things up. There's a better answer than that. That answer is gravitation. The law of gravitation holds all these things up and in their place. But what is gravitation? It is the power of God manifested in Jesus Christ in creation. That is gra gravitation. Now, I'm, I'm, I've studied science since I was a little kid, and I've always been interested, especially in physics and in orbits. Um, uh, the movement of the planets and so forth, which is why I had such an interest in um, the calendars and chronology and all those things. Now, when it comes to the idea of gravitation, um, the one thing that scientists can't really explain is why it exists at all. And of course, they have theories. There's, you know, um, different particles, you know, the God particle. Um, uh, that somehow gives this gravitation, all these different things that particles uh, cause gravitation, a lot of very silly theories. Um, but the thing is, gravitation comes from the fact that there is a power in the universe that causes these things, because we know that mass and energy uh, are the same thing, just in a different form. So when you convert mass into energy, you have this release of energy, like in a nuclear explosion. Um, but all these things, and even from a nuclear point of view, the things that holds that atom together, it's not gravitation, but uh, uh, that is, is something that is extremely powerful. So, Cohesion in science is to hold together, but what is cohesion? All the answer that science can give is the word cohesion. is from two Latin words, co and here, which means hold together. In other words, cohesion is cohesion. That is the answer. There is a better answer than that. There is God's answer. He tells us that cohesion is the power of God manifested in Jesus Christ in creation. For by him, all things consist, cohere, hold together. That is cohesion. Um, now, there was a comment here in the chat from um, Councils to the Church, I believe, page 324. And so you can read that. Um, God does not annul his laws, but he is continually working through them, using them as his instruments. They are not self-working. And see, that's the problem is that science thinks that these things just exist. Just out of, and, and they know that the universe and they even try to say the universe is self-existent. Uh, but where did the laws come from that could ca cause the universe to come into existence in the first place? So they have no explanation for why these things are the way they are. So God is perpetually at work in nature. She is his servant, directed as he pleases. Nature, in her work, um, <clears throat> testifies of the intelligent presence and active agency of a being who moves in all his work according to his will. It is not by an original power. 
inherent in nature that year by year the earth yields its bounties and continues its march around the sun. The hand of infinite power is perpetually at work guiding this planet. It is God's power momentarily exercised that keeps it in position and it's in its rotation. And Jones is showing that this exists in his word itself. That God's word isn't just something that brings something into existence. It continues to work in holding things together. Right? It continues to work in doing these things. Creation is not just a one-time act. It is a continual work. But it is spoken. God doesn't have to continually speak. He spoke, and that power is in his word. So all things were created by the word of God, right? And his word is powerful so that it continues to work. That's, that's Joan's point here. The origin of all things is not spontaneous generation. It is not evolution. It is God manifest, the power of God manifested in Jesus Christ by his word producing all things that are seen, which before did not appear at all. Then God in Jesus Christ is the origin of all things. That is creation. God in Jesus Christ is the preserver of all things. That is cohesion. God in Jesus Christ is the upholder of all things, and that is gravitation. Now, what we're going to see is that Jones, we're not going to go into reading the next study, but what Jones, um, and we see this in other presentations of his, is that when we look at uh, salvation, so when we apply this to the Christian life, God wor God's word recreates us. It preserves us, that is, it makes us cohere, hold together, and it upholds us. So the, the work of recreating the character of Christ in man, the image of God in man, is a something that comes from his word, and it's produced from his word, and it has to be continually um upheld we have to be continually upheld by his word man does not stand on his own we can't just become perfect and then go on on our own we need constantly god's word upholding us we are not creators we're not the producers of righteousness god is he's the source of all things now you know, he started out here and he's going to finish it off in the next couple, but dealing with this idea about Sabbath and Sunday and, and Saturday, you know, Saturday keepers, Adventists who are Saturday keepers, who don't know God, who don't have God. And yet they're going about uh, believing that they're Christians. And that includes us, right? Are we really truly trusting in God for righteousness? Is he truly the one who is um, sanctifying us and making us holy? Or are we simply just playing a game? And what God has given us with all of these lines, these prophecies, is he's given us an understanding of scripture that should, if we allow it to, recreate in us because it is something we depend upon. We have to have faith in God's word. And very few people do. Very few Christians have faith in his word. Very few people in this movement have faith in his word. We don't trust that God can take care of his truth. We have to work things out. We have to try to be God. And so much like the Babylonians who look at their, uh, get their soothsayers and their astrologers and their monthly pronosticators, we somehow believe that if we can know, if we can use these lines and know what's going to come, that we can then be ready. But if our conversation, if our talk is that we are better than other people, then we're not going to be ready because we're under a deception. We can't. 
we can't reflect God's character if we don't have his character, which is one of humility. So this is what God is bringing us to. In, in order to, to have the character of Christ, we have to trust his word that he's going to accomplish what he says. And that we, we can trust that he is working in the lives of others. And that we're not going to counter his word by tearing down others through gossip and rumors. But we're going to do everything we can to cooperate with Christ in the work of lifting up those that are fallen. Cooperate with him in the work of salvation. And if we do that, we will be united as a movement. We will be able to accomplish the work that he's asking us to do. Any thoughts about what we have read here? It's one of the shorter ones. <clears throat> so we're gonna, I think we have 20 and 21 or something like that. There might be another one. Any thoughts about this message that come to people's minds, what Jones is saying about who God is? Well, if nobody has any thoughts, we can close with prayer. Okay. Let's pray then. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath and for the time that we have had together this evening. We know, Lord, that... Um, we are no different than those in the world. We seek to avoid our responsibilities. We try to get by with as little as we can. Um, we think that we can be half-hearted and still be Christians and still be saved. But we know, Lord, that you have a higher calling than, human, um, than humans can reach, but that you promise in your word that you will accomplish this work in us. Help us to cooperate with you, to yield our will to you. And um, we pray for the people in this movement, for the time that we are in, uh, that we can come together, that your work will be accomplished in us. Be with us throughout this Sabbath in the meetings tomorrow and help us uh, to continue to learn at the foot of the cross, to yoke up with Christ, and to learn of his meekness and loneliness. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.